Hi, back again. <laughs> Hello. Uh, we'll wait like a couple of minutes before we'll start. Um, and then and then I'll introduce you to the audience. Okay, that sounds great. Hi, Frank. How are you? Hi, Katarina. Hi, Ryan. Hello. Okay. Um, yeah, we can we can slowly start and go ahead and introduce you. And um, I think people um, will still be coming. Um, um slowly in so but uh yeah let's not make the people that are already here make them wait so welcome to the science society club and um we are very happy to introduce you to um dr ryan field uh he's uh he really was so kind to make time for presenting his really amazing work. Um, so yeah, we are, um, thank you so much for being here. And I wanted to give you some information about um, uh, Dr. Ryan Field. He's the uh, Chief Technological Officer at Kernel. And um, it is based out of Col Culver City, I'm sorry, <laughs> California, United States. And um, uh, Ryan um, has did his bet, uh, bachelor degree in electrical engineering and physics in North Carolina State University, and his master's degree in electrical engineering at Columbia University, and his PhD in electrical engineering also at Columbia University. And yeah, a little bit um, about uh, kernel. Um, it's a, a team of neuroscientists, physicists, engineers, programmers, and experiment and operation experts that are driven by the belief that exploring and quantifying the human mind is the most important and consequential opportunity of our time. And yeah, I really admire that uh, spirit. And with that, Welcome, Ryan, to our club, and thank you so much for taking the time. Yes, thanks for the introduction, and thank you for having me. Uh, before I get started, I will point out, uh, if you looked at the, the paper that's linked here in the room, uh, there are about, I think, 30 authors listed. So the work I'm presenting tonight is really a, a huge team effort from uh, everyone who's been at Kernel for the last couple of years as we've built this technology. Uh, and our team is 
just about 100 people now. So the, the company has grown, grown quite a lot. Um, so with that uh, out of the way, I'll go ahead and just give you a brief outline of what I'll talk about for, uh, I'll try and talk for about 20, 25 minutes and then give some time for everyone to ask questions uh, that you may have in response. Uh, so I'll start with just a little bit of background information about the technology and uh, how it differs from some other types of uh, brain computer interfaces or BCIs. Uh, I will walk through some of the characterization results in the paper and explain a little bit about what they mean, uh, highlight some of my favorite ones and, and you know, uh, speak to the significance of, uh, of, of each of them. And then at the end, I'll, I'll briefly talk about some of the results that we have from human measurements. So with that, um, I'll start just by setting the background here for the, the technology. Um, there, there are a number of ways that you can uh, measure signals from the brain. Um, there are uh, what I would call neuronal signals or what are called neuronal signals, which are uh, as close to direct measures of the electrical activity of the neurons in the brain as they fire. So uh, if you, you think about groups of neurons, they're communicating uh, through transfer of charge, which creates these electric currents and generate electric and magnetic fields. And so you can use uh, techniques to measure the electric fields. Uh, this is commonly known as EEG, or you can use techniques to measure the magnetic fields. Uh, this is a, a technique called MEG. Um, uh, however, there's a, another indirect way of measuring brain activity or when groups of neurons fire, and that's by looking at hemodynamic signals. And the kind of fundamental of how hemodynamic signals emerge is that when groups of neurons start to, to fire, uh, they need oxygen uh, to, to do the work that they're doing. And so your uh, cardiovascular system provides uh, oxygen local to, to the groups of neurons that are firing. So you get a fresh uh, kind of what I, I think of as fresh inrush of blood in the areas where your neurons are, are doing work. And activity is changing, uh, detecting changes in local blood oxygenation. And it's a, a technique that's commonly used with either fMRI or uh, a technique called FNIRS or functional near infrared spectroscopy. And what I'm gonna talk about for the rest of tonight is FNIRS, which is this uh, technique for using optics for measuring changes in blood oxygenation levels of the brain. So if you uh, want a very common example of how this works, you can look at the latest watches from both Apple and Fitbit. They include a device, a sensor, that allows you to measure blood oxygenation at your wrist. So they use uh, different wavelengths of light to measure the oxygen concentration of the blood at your wrist, and they give you some blood oxygenation percentage. Uh, fundamentally, the technique that we're doing is very similar to that. So FNIRS generally uses two wavelengths of light, and these wavelengths are chosen specifically so that one is absorbed more by uh, oxygen oxygenated hemoglobin, and the other is absorbed more by deoxygenated hemoglobin. And so as the local blood oxygenation changes, these two wavelengths of light, um, the, the two wavelengths of light as measured by some detector nearby uh, will have their amplitude modulated. The, the, the intensity of the signal will change based on the local blood oxygenation. So this, um, this kind of absorption-based change in blood oxygenation has been around for decades. Uh, a lot of interesting work has been published on applications of FNIRS, so measuring the brain using uh, this optical uh, technique. And Kernel, uh, as a company, kind of identified a way to take uh, FNIRS and take it to the next level. And that, that method was, uh, is called time domain FNIRS. So it's like using the traditional version of FNIRS, which is based on absorption, uh, but now we're adding a time domain element to it where we use very short pulses of laser light and measure the, the photons that uh, propagate through the brain 
uh, we measure how long it takes to get from where the laser fired to where the detector picks it up. And these types of systems have been developed in research settings. And the, the big advantage of them is that they provide more information than your traditional standard FNIR systems. Uh, this additional information is that not only do you get changes in absorption, but you also get to measure changes in scattering of the tissue. And so time domain information adds a new dimension to doing FNIR's measurements. Uh, further, because of the nature of this measurement, where you're uh, pulsing a very short pulse of laser light and then detecting how long it takes photons to come out uh, out of the head near the detector, uh, you get some information uh, from this time of flight about how deep the photons went into the head. And this is really nice because this depth information will allow you to separate uh, signals that happen in superficial layers like our scalp from those that are happening deeper uh, from the brain and the brain is really what we're interested in the scalp is just a uh, you know if, if you think back to the apple watch example uh, the signal in the scalp will be very strong because you you also have blood vessels in the in the scalp and your heart is beating so you get this you know cardiac pulse um, and so you want to be able to separate that strong uh, scalp signal from the the much weaker brain signal that happens underneath it. And so if, if I step back and talk a little bit about the hardware that's been used for these types of time domain or time of flight systems, they've always been done in kind of a rack mounted type of system. And there's this quote that's on the uh, FNIR's Wikipedia page when it talks about time domain that, that I love, it's still there. and. I don't want anyone uh, from Kernel to go modify it. I, I want to see how long it stays up. But uh, the, the quote is, time domain based devices are totally immobile, space consuming, the most difficult to make, costliest, hugest, and heaviest. Even so, they have the highest depth sensitivity and are capable of presenting the most accurate values of baseline hemoglobin concentration and oxygenation. So, what we've done at Kernel is we basically canceled that entire quote. We've built Kernel Flow, which is a miniaturized and scaled version of the system that's designed to be wearable. It, uh, in our opinion, is the best non-invasive technology that could be built in a way that would enable the broadest uh, application of brain measurement to society. So we think it's a platform that you can build all kinds of brain measurement based applications on top of. Uh, and uh, kind of the, the favorite, favorite quote of mine from uh, Brian, our CEO, is that what we've really done is the equivalent of making a mainframe into a PC. We've done that level of miniaturization, taking a whole room full of equipment and putting into a very small form factor that for the first time kind of brings in the possibility that it could be uh, widely adopted and scaled. So with this background, now I, I wanna talk a little bit about what we've done to demonstrate that the system we built actually performs the same or better than that rack mounted hardware. Does our PC compete with the mainframe of uh, TDF nearest devices? And this is what the, the uh, JBO paper that we published really uh, set out to show. So if you think about the brain uh, and, you know, what it takes to measure it uh, and, you know, take one step back and say, how do you characterize a system that's meant to measure the brain, which is this uh, biological system that's constantly changing, highly variable and so hard to control. Uh, so what the researchers in the field have done is they've, they've come up with these three standard protocols that they use to evaluate systems in the absence of a brain so they can try and predict how well the system will work in measuring uh, actual human brains. And so the, the three commonly used protocols are called the basic, basic instrument performance or BIP protocol, uh, the MedFOT protocol, and the NeuroPT protocol. If you're interested in some of the work on these protocols, there was actually a collaboration that was based in Europe back in 2019 that looked at uh, all the time domain systems in the world and character, characterize them against these three protocols. And that effort was called Bitmap. Uh, and uh, I thought it was a really good 
uh, overview of just where the field was in terms of the time domain systems. So in the JBO paper, we cover most of these three protocols, but not all. And I'll not go through every result in the paper, but we'll highlight some of uh, the ones that I think are most interesting that show unique capabilities of our system performance. So the one I'll start with is what's called the responsivity metric. It's part of the BIP protocol and the measure all uh, in the paper. Uh, but if you look at figure 11 in the paper, this is the, the result I'm gonna talk about. So responsivity is really a measure of the sensitivity of our detector. And why this is interesting to me is that most time domain systems that have been built use these specialized detectors that are typically made from 3.5 materials. Uh, the reason they're made from these materials is because they're more sensitive to infrared light. Ours, on the other hand, is made from a standard CMOS or silicon process, and silicon is inherently bad at detecting infrared light. Uh, this is something we knew when we chose to design it in silicon, but we chose to build it in silicon because we wanted to build something that scales. It needed to have the same properties that all the consumer electronics that we buy have in order for us to, to scale it to something that could be used in, in the mainstream, and that's both low cost and uh, widely accessible. And what we found through the characterization is that uh, our detectors that we custom designed were able to maintain sensitivity that's in the order of uh, the specialized detectors. And not only did we show that we could maintain the sensitivity of these detectors, we also demonstrated that we can record um, kind of record-breaking uh, photon count rates with a constant responsivity. And so what I mean by this is if you, you look at the, the paper, uh, we show the responsivity measure as a function of how many counts per second we pick up at the detector. And our detectors are capable of picking up over a billion counts per second. And if you look at most common, um, most of the rack mounted systems, they're usually in the 10 tens of millions counts per second. So we've really uh, gone up by two orders of magnitude in the number of counts per second we're able to detect and we've maintained the responsivity of the detectors. Uh, the next kind of uh, result that I really want to highlight is what's called the instrument response function or IRF. And this is what's shown in figure 12. And the, the most interesting characteristic of this for me is the dynamic range that you can see in this plot. So we're able to achieve almost five orders of dynamic range in this, um, uh, in this figure. And so what you see is the difference between the peak at uh, 10 to the zero counts uh, versus the, the noise floor before the peak, which is just above 10 to the minus five. So we've normalized every here, everything here to, to a value of one. So the peak is at one and everything else is normalized to that. Uh, so we have almost five orders of magnitude. And why this is significant is that the dynamic range allows us to use shorter um, channel lengths or the distance between the laser source and the detector can be shorter and we're still able to resolve uh, changes in brain, uh, brain related changes in the signal. And uh, to me, this is important because it's one of the key advantages that allow you to build a compact and wearable system, which is being able to pack the sources and detectors closely together inside a module. Um, but, you know, the, this is nice, it's a great result. And, you know, one of the questions is, can you have a wearable system that's also stable? Does it perform the same way over time? And so the, the next measure that, that I wanted to highlight was figure 13, which is a measure of the IRF as a function of time. And what you can see is that uh, after a warm up of about 20 minutes, the, the characteristics of that IRF curve uh, remain pretty constant for the rest of the time. The, the, the thing that you know, I, I am kind of proud of in, in seeing this is that uh, unlike the rack mounted equipment where they may also have you know, pretty stable IRFs over time, we don't use any temperature regulating devices uh, to control either the temperature of the detector or the lasers. 
And again, this is an important consideration for building a wearable system. If you want to build something wearable, you can't uh, spend the cost of uh, the cost, both in terms of weight and power of trying to cool off or maintain a constant temperature of the components in the system. And you know, there, there are a lot more details on the BIP protocol that if you want to dig into, you can, but I'd, I'd like to move on uh, to the, the next protocol, which is the, the Neuropt protocol. And the main question that Neuropt is trying to address is how well can a system resolve localized changes in absorption? So they have a couple of tests and we did one of them where uh, you use a, a cylinder of known properties. So it's made of PVC, it has a certain uh, volume and dimensions are all specified by the protocol. Uh, and you place it in a liquid phantom. So this is a kind of a tank filled with a liquid that has known absorption and scattering properties. And those absorption and scattering properties are chosen such that they're representative of what you would find in the human head. And so in this test, you move the cylinder away from the source and detector. You move it away from the lasers and the detector and see how far you're able to resolve that change, that localized change in absorption due to the cylinder. And what we see in these curves, uh, there are a couple of interesting things. So first, what you can see is that out past 20 millimeters, there is measurable contrast and uh, CNR, which is a contrast to noise ratio, a measure of uh, how confident we can be in, in resolving that contrast. Um, in addition, it, it, um, you know, each of the, the lines in this chart uh, represent a different time delay after the laser was fired. So this highlights really what the, the power of the time domain technique is again. So if each of these windows is a 500 picosecond uh, time window after the laser fires increasing. So window zero is a time from zero to 500 picoseconds. Window one is from 501 to 1000 picoseconds and so on. And so what you can see here is that there's a function of how strong the signal is in each window based on how deep the cylinder is. And so this gets back to the beginning where I was describing how time domain gives you additional information based on traditional ethnier systems. It gives you both scattering properties and it gives you an indication of, of depth based on the time of flight, how long it took the photon uh, to come back out. So, uh, you know, anyone who, who uses this type of system will find this, this type of plot really cool because it shows really that you can distinguish um, different depths of change in the absorption using the time domain information. So that, um, that's the one, one measurement from the Neuropt uh, protocol that we did. And I'll move on now to talk a little bit about the MedVote uh, protocol. So the MedVote protocol is an array of solid phantoms, each with a known absorption and scattering property. So you have this uh, two-dimensional array. I think there's a, a figure above in the paper that, that shows them with increasing absorption and scattering properties. And we choose the ranges of absorption and scattering to match what's expected again in the biological tissues we're trying to measure. And um, you know, each of these phantoms is calibrated and you know, it's known to have uh, these, these scattering and absorption properties. And so this is where we're going to try and flex and show that our time domain system not only improves on some of the, the things that, uh, you know, I mentioned before in terms of, uh, counting more photons, et cetera, being smaller. Um, it also is still able to resolve the expected absorption and scattering coefficients. Uh, and so in figure 15 on the left side, what you see are these, uh, what, are, what are actually scatter plots of uh, measurements taken each in a five millisecond window. So we, we fire the laser uh, in these 100 picosecond pulses at a 20 megahertz frequency. So in a period of five milliseconds, I think we fire the laser 100,000 times, if I remember uh, correctly off the top of my head. So 
and 100,000 laser pulses, uh, we use that to get one measurement. And from that 100,000 laser pulse measurement, we're able to, to see what the, the optical absorption and scattering properties are for that phantom. And what we see in this, this figure on the left side is that there's pretty good clustering of um, our measurements around the same absorption and scattering property. There is a slight deviation from the absolute expected value, um, but some of that can be explained by uh, you know, some of the errors that occur both in calibrating and the assumptions that go into to calculating the measured properties. So what we, we like to see is that they're tightly clustered. That means they're, you know, they're, there's some amount of precision to this measurement and we're, we're able to reproduce it uh, in every five millisecond window that we, we record from. The other like positive result is that there's a good linear relationship between the measured expected values for both absorption and scattering. So that's what you see on the right-hand side. Um, so you expect as the, you know, the absorption scales up, you get a, a similar change in your uh, measured value. And, and we do see that. Uh, so the deltas are good, the relative changes are good. Uh, we just have a little bit of absolute error in where the uh, absorption and scattering properties land. Um, and then if you kind of go ahead to the next figure, figure 16, we repeated one of the stability tests that we did early on. Um, well, it's actually a little different. So early on, uh, you know, 10 minutes ago, I was talking about the IRF stability, the stability of our system and how well it performs over time. And here, what we're looking at, how we have a measure of a known optical phantom uh, and we're looking at how uh, how accurate we're able to measure that um, the both the absorption and scattering properties over time, and so we a plot of measured absorption over a two hour window. So we collected the data for two hours straight, and you can see uh, the estimated absorption for both of the wavelengths we use, which are six ninety nanometers and eight fifty nanometers, uh, and the uh, shaded regions show plus or minus five percent, so we're well within five percent over the whole uh, whole time period. All right, so that kind of wraps up the stuff I wanted to highlight on the phantom data side. All of this is great, and it shows the characteristics of the system and that it's working as we expect it, and it kind of matches with the fundamentals of the time domain FNIRS uh, technique. Uh, however, what we really care about is recording the signals from the brain of a human. And you know, while the paper mostly focused on the phantom work, uh, I want to switch gears a little bit and, and talk about what's at the end, which are the human measurement results. So the first uh, kind of an important thing to look at is in figure 17, you can see this nice um, signal that shows uh, you know, what, what looks like if you, you had asked me to draw like the, the waves in the ocean or something. What this is is, uh, is a, a heart rate signal from a person that's wearing the flow device. And the reason that I, I wanna point this out is this is extremely rare for a time domain system to be able to domain systems integrate for about a one second measurement. So where I mentioned before, we're using 100,000 laser pulses uh, spanning a, a time period of about five milliseconds. Uh, most uh, FNIRs, time domain FNIR systems, measure for a whole second. And because they're measuring for a whole second for every uh, data point, they're not able to see uh, a very nice, clean heart rate like this. And I actually think it's really important that um, you know, I point this out because one of our biggest challenges is dealing with physiological signals that we measure that are not brain data or not brain signals. And so this is uh, you know, what would be called biological noise. It's everything else that's going on in the body, your heart rate, your respiration rate, uh, your changes in blood pressure. All of these biological noise signals uh, can be much larger than the actual neural signal or, or brain signals that you're trying to measure. So by having the ability to precisely uh, characterize things like the heart rate, it makes it easier to remove it from the data that you measure so that you can look at just the, the neural responses, the brain activity. Um, so 
you know, I'll, I'll kind of skip ahead now to figure 19, which is the real functional brain imaging task. Uh, so here, what we've done is a, a kind of classical motor task where we had two different participants here. Uh, one of them did two sessions, one did a single uh, session of finger tapping. And so what, what the, the task is, is uh, each person is prompted to either tap their fingers together on their left hand or their right hand based on a cue. And it's well known and understood that when you use your right hand, the motor cortex on the left side of your brain will activate. And when you use your left hand, uh, the right side motor cortex activates. So this is a commonly used experiment because we know what to expect. Uh, we know that when the left hand's tapping, we want to see activation on the right side. So in the figure, uh, in the kind of center of the figure, there's this you know, cartoon head picture. And we show the results for left minus right tapping. So this is when a person taps their left hand, what the brain activation looks like, minus what the brain activation looks like from when they tap their right hand. And you see these two localized areas on the left, there's a blue patch, which corresponds to a deactivation, uh, as we expect. So when they're tapping their left hand, the left side of their brain is less active. And on the right, you see this red patch, which it, it corresponds to an increase in activation. So when you tap your left hand, the right side is more active. So this is expected and everything looks great. And if you look at the waveforms above, you can see uh, the actual signals that were collected uh, during one of these experiments. And the kind of pink or reddish color uh, bars or regions denote uh, when the cue, the prompt told them to tap their right hand. And the green bars represent when the prompt told them to tap their left hand. And these waveforms are from a lo location on the right motor cortex. So what you would expect is an increase in blood oxygenation during the green regions, uh, which you can clearly see uh, in the waveforms there. Um, and then similarly, you, you kind of expect the, the reverse when the right, right hand is tapping. Um, so with all this, you know, it's been about 30 minutes now. Uh, I'll just conclude and say that you know, what I really wanted to highlight is that we've taken this room size technology and miniaturized it so that it can be head worn. And not only have we done that miniaturization, we've also managed to exceed or maintain the performance of uh, systems that um, you know, were previously state of the art. So I'll uh, just stop there. And you know, thank you for, for taking the time to, to listen to that and to kind of look at the work that uh, everyone at Kernel uh, has been doing. And I'm happy to answer any questions that uh, you all may have. Thank you so much, Ryan, for this really great um, guiding us through this really wonderful work. Um, it's so impressive, but I'll give everyone here um, a chance to speak. So go ahead, flash your mics or go in PTR. Um, yeah. Hey, Serena, go ahead. Fascinating work. Um, really, it looks, you know, like you've just really nailed this thing. High resolution, tight temporal resolution. Um, is it is it the case in, in the takeaway from Figure Eighteen that you you can go uh, you're getting measurements six centimeters in? And uh, okay, yeah. So fi Figure Eighteen is not into the brain; it's across the brain. So that is uh, how much measure um, how much signal we measure from any one laser on the headset to any one detector. And so we have the whole head covered. So there's a range of spacings from say one laser, we'll have you know some detectors that are 10 millimeters away, some that are 20, uh, some that are as far out as um, 60 millimeters. But what you can really see from that figure is that at about 35 millimeters away from the laser is where the signal um, kind of flat, flattens out. So we're not really seeing any measurement beyond 35 millimeters on the head. Okay, no, fa just fascinating work. I'm gonna give other people a chance to ask questions, but I certainly have more as we go. Thank you.
Hi, Ryan. This is Denise. I had a quick question. It's uh, probably out of scope, but I was wondering if there were any um, people that you had an opportunity to test this tech with who had COVID or if you can see any sort of application for this technology to help diagnose uh, or treat people who are suffering with long COVID right now? Yeah, uh, that's a really great question. We have not measured anyone with COVID. Our, um, so all of our experiments and studies are done uh, under IRB review. And so all of our protocols specifically have COVID testing and uh, vaccination requirements to avoid exposing uh, kernel employees who are running the experiments from potential COVID. So we haven't done that. Um, in terms of diagnosing COVID, I think it would probably just be easier to use a, a more traditional blood oxygenation monitor than you know brain uh, blood oxygenation monitor. Long COVID is something that uh, we're interested in and have thought about. And you know, if uh, if there was uh, a group or organization that wanted to sponsor some research in that that domain, we we would be in support of because uh, we know that there is a lot of uh, I don't know anxiety, stress, uh, cognitive issues that, that have been associated with, with COVID. And that is something that you could measure with a device like ours. Thank you for your answer. Uh, hi, Ryan. Uh, thanks for the uh, very uh, detailed uh, uh, explanation of your uh, excellent uh, paper there. And uh, I have uh, two questions. The uh, first of all, uh, in your uh, setup, uh, I mean, using the Apple Watch uh, uh, example, which I, I saw their uh, flyers, they, they use some sort of, a, you know, there's an angle, a bleak angle to um, fire the laser and take this signal. So in your case, you have the sample, uh, your, your light actually, pen, I mean, go through the, the sample, right? Or... Um. Yeah, that's a, a good question. So we, we work in uh, what's typically called reflectance mode, uh, but the light is not actually reflecting off of the skin. What happens is uh, we fire the laser directly into the, the head. And, uh, you know, you think of a laser pulse and just think of it as injecting something like 10 billion photons all at once into the head. Uh, and so if we look at kind of like the, the particle theory of light, these photons are going to, to bounce around as they scatter off of uh, cells uh, in, the, in the head, whether that is in the scalp, the skull, or the brain. And so, so what you end up seeing is like this, it's a diffusion process, really, where we inject all these photons at one point, and uh, light diffuses uh, kind of horizontally, and very small amounts of it are picked up at the detector side. So for every, I don't know, 10 billion photons we put in, maybe we get, I don't know, 50 or 100 photons that we can measure at the detector. And that's why we you know, pulse 100,000 uh, laser pulses per measurement, because you know, with 100,000 laser pulses, we can build up um, a measurement of tens of millions of photons. And that gives us pretty good accuracy of, um, uh, of the, the measure. And I'll just kind of remind everyone too, uh, you know, the, the fundamental principle is the same as if you, you know, take the, the flashlight of your cell phone and put it on the palm of your hand, you can see that you, you don't have just that spot of the, the flashlight where the light is emitted, the entire hand kind of has this glow to it. And that's, that's because of the same kind of diffusion process. You can see this in action where if you put light in at a, a point, it actually spreads out quite a lot through the tissue. Uh, due to all the scattering. I see. Thanks. And uh, my second question is the the shrink shrink. Uh, the I understand this is a, a collaborative work, but can you uh, comment on a, uh, w what is the bottleneck that uh, uh, you overcome enable you to shrink down uh, from? I mean, the earlier cold you had. I mean. The, the previous, you know, bulky and heavy is the laser module or detector or uh, the chip or I mean, of course, going CMOS probably is one uh, winning strategy, right? Yeah, so it's um, it's all of the above. So Kernel really is uh, a full stack company. We have 
uh, people that work at every level from kind of like the single photon all the way up to machine learning. Uh, and so I, I actually started working on, you know, my, my PhD was in a similar technique doing time correlated single photon counting. So, you know, pulsing lasers of light and detecting these single photons as they, um, they get detected. And, you know, that's, that's kind of at the device level uh, where, where we started with the integration as we, we focused on the detector and the detector electronics and how we could miniaturize and integrate as much of those as possible. However, if you look at the first laser we bought, the first laser we bought was probably uh, twice the size of a, a typical microwave. It was a big, bulky device, um, and we, you know, it could do so many things. It had so many options and, and you know, all these different uh, knobs you can turn for it. And what we did is we just pulled out what was essential and designed our own laser drivers and laser circuitry uh, where we could use off-the-shelf laser diodes uh, but drive them in a way that allows us to generate these really short pulses of laser light. And you know, that's as important as uh, the detector design. And then everything up, up the stack from there, the microcontrollers that read the data, the signal processing that cleans it, the analysis that's done, even the way that the, uh, the neuroscience is structured, the way we uh, you know, generate and present the stimulus to see what the, the brain re reacts to it. Uh, all of that is kind of done by kernel in a, in a very full stack manner. Thank you. You're welcome. Question, Ryan. Um, it, is it possible to sacrifice like a temporal signal if you did something like a two photon approach, like with a longer wavelength? Uh, I imagine because you're talking about very few photons out that maybe the signal would be very slow, but. Uh, is, is there a way to apply something like that in a kind of compact format? Yeah, so um, two, two photon microscopy is really interesting um, because uh, it, what you're effectively doing is combining the energy of two photons that arrive at um, you know, a, a fluorophore or some kind of fluorescent molecule at the same time temporally. So you kind of have two photons at the same place, same time, that give you twice as much energy and allow you to excite it. Uh, and that gives you that better depth penetration to kind of get down and focus where you want. Uh, this is a little different in that um, we, we actually get our photons spread out over many nanoseconds because each photon that goes into the, the, the brain is scattering around through the tissue before it comes back out. And you know, we choose the, the wavelengths of light, 690 and 850, uh, based on the properties of hemoglobin. And it's like two states, oxygenated versus deoxygenated. We could go to longer wavelengths. We go to 1064 instead of 850. But the downside to that is that you then need a, an exotic detector again in order to measure those long wavelengths because the band gap of silicon uh, is... Uh, uh, such that you can't measure uh, anything beyond a uh, you know uh, 1100 micron or 1100 nanometers about thanks so, yeah sure curious about this spatial resolution you can derive uh in these dense arrays um how, how certain can you know where the signal came from? Yeah, yeah. Th thanks for asking the million dollar question. This is the one that, uh, <laughs> that everyone brings up. And it's a really, really difficult question to answer uh, because it's hard to get ground truth, um, right? Like it's hard to know mm. exactly how big of a volume was activated in the brain and, you know, to what extent, you know, how much of an absorption change was that? So our best, uh, our best proxy is to look at these phantom experiments, which are uh, things like the Neuropt protocol, where we have a known uh, you know, uh, device and we look at our ability to resolve it. Uh, so I don't have a specific example or, or number to give you, but I will say that FNIR's devices typically have uh, come up with clever experiments to show that they're able to get in the, the range of one to two centimeters resolution within the brain. So it's not the same resolution as you would get from an fMRI, 
uh, but it's you know within an order of magnitude. And you know when you kind of weigh some of the the benefits of being portable and lower cost and just generally more accessible, uh, maybe that's an acceptable trade off for you. Well, I wonder if you know knowing certain. Uh, knowing the mapping between function and, and regions, if you can build up uh, a spatial map of registration through, uh, you know, different types of experiments, having the subject do different things at different parts of their body or different types of, you know, language areas or um, other types of signals and, you know, derive a registration that's patient specific, but then allows you to characterize um, more spatial resolution. Yeah, so if if you do have access to a scanner, an, an MRI scanner, and can do fMRI uh, with the same paradigm on the same subject and do co-registration between the FDRs and the fMRI, uh, then you can compare if, um, you know, how close does the FNIRS data get to the fMRI data in terms of its uh, spatial localization. That's not something we've done, uh, but it, it is something that can be done. And people tend to look at things like um, retinotopy as a very uh, uh, common one where you're looking at kind of the, the projection of the visual field onto the, um, you know, the, the back of the, the cortex, the occipital cortex. Well, can you comment on some of your your near term use cases now that you've you know achieved this level of of readiness? Sure. Yeah, we um, we've had quite a few public announcements recently. So one is we're working with a psychedelic company to do a proof of concept study on uh, wearing kernel flow while. Um, uh, Participants were, were doing healthy controls in this case, or healthy participants um, uh, undergo a psychedelic experiment uh, using ketamine. So we'll measure their brain responses while uh, they undergo a, a ketamine treatment, as is typically done for uh, some treatments of uh, depression or other things. So uh, that's one kind of proof of concept that we're we're in progress on, and I think the first session is scheduled to happen in the next week. Um, the other we have this uh, gaming study that we did with uh, a company that's actually based out of New York called State Space. They uh, uh, spun out of NYU, I think, and they they make a first person shooter training game called uh, Aim Lab. And one of the, the kind of training tasks in it is called Grid Shot. And so we did a little demo with a, a professional gamer named Scump, who is a world champion Call of Duty player. And we measured his brain while he was doing this training program, and we measured our CEO's brain while he was doing it, uh, not being a professional gamer. Um, and so what we, we found is that there are differences between a novice and a professional uh, gamer's brain. And then we kind of recruited people in to do the experiment for and see um, you know, if we could build up some group statistics to show what those differences are um, and you know, w which of those are statistically significant. Uh, so that's our gaming study. Uh, we're in the process of uh, starting up a, oh, oh, we also have an ongoing attention study, which looks at uh, meditation and its effect on uh, mindfulness or mind wandering. So being able to measure changes in uh, focus state or mind wandering state. Uh, we're about to start an emotion classification study. So can we uh, measure signatures of the brain that uh, become apparent when uh, a person either views a emotional video or listens to an emotional uh, soundtrack. And here again, we're, we're using labeled uh, clips, either video or audio, uh, to kind of have this ground truth of, of what is, um, you know, what, what the expected emotion is. So we can use that to build a classifier and use brain, brain data to classify emotional state. Uh, and then the, the third one that we're just about to start uh, piloting is around uh, measuring healthy aging. So we're looking at, I think, 11 different uh, brain-based markers that we measure with kernel flow and how they change over uh, uh, you know, the, the entire population's age range. So we're looking at uh, individuals from 18 to 75 
and how certain markers change based on age group. And what we're looking for there is a, uh, a kind of trajectory of normal aging. You know, what does healthy aging look like as you, you know, uh, progress through the course of your life? And we think this is significant because uh, a lot of future interventions uh, specifically target, targeted at uh, you know, advanced aging, cognitive decline, dementia, et cetera, um, uh, they may be more effective if you can have a regular test to find out where someone's uh, you know, brain function is uh, versus where it's expected to be based on their age. Uh, so some, some kind of early warning. Um, and yeah, there's one more uh, partnership we're just starting up that I don't want to talk too much about yet, but uh, there's other stuff in the pipeline and we're, we're really trying to, to broaden out the, the applications and, and areas that we're doing work on. So all those things I just described to you are being done by kernel uh, through IRB approved studies and you know, working to, to really demonstrate some of the, the applications to, you know, to, to using kernel flow. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask, so what is more or less the estimated cost of the device and do you think because we you talked about um, using it maybe for a diagnosis or pre-diagnosis do you think it's brought like it's it's in the um, in the range that like primary care doctors could just you know and people starting in their 50s or so screening for parkinson or you know, like use it in general, large population for screening for for neurodegenerative diseases. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So right now, uh, our devices uh, we're we're currently in low production volume, so we're producing around a hundred devices this year, and so our our production costs put the 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 price of the device around a hundred thousand uh, dollars as we uh, generate some demand. For our devices, then uh, our volumes will increase and the cost will go down quite significantly. So as I mentioned early on, every decision we made about the hardware uh, was made uh, in order to make sure that as we start to hit volumes of 1,000 and 10,000, 100,000 or a million devices in the field, uh, you know, we can start to see those costs drop down. Um, and our estimate is that you know, if we if we have very widespread adoption of this device, we can get the, the whole headset price eventually down under $5,000. But today it's 100,000 and you know, long-term, uh, you know, our, our, our objective, I think we, we stated a year or two ago is to kind of make it so that everyone could have a kernel flow in their home by 2033. So you know, kind of piggybacking on that mainframe to PC uh, concept, you know, most people couldn't own a mainframe. Uh, it's far too expensive and power hungry. But once PCs were available, you know, it was still expensive. It was, uh, it took a lot. Uh, I remember when I got my first PC, it was not cheap. Uh, and I know my parents worked hard to, to make sure we, we could have one. And, and, you know, that's where kernel flow will, will you know, start. And eventually we'll get to, to a place where it's in the, the range of an iPhone. But I think that's going to happen over kind of the, the next decade or something. Um, so I, I will also add that, you know, based on some of the, the work from these uh, initial like application explorations, we may find that only certain regions of coverage are needed in order to drive the, the measurements uh, that are required to, to do each application. So if you think back to, um, I don't know, like I, I mentioned the, the mindfulness or attention task, uh, a lot of the, the brain that's involved in your attention is all in the prefrontal cortex. So you may not need a whole head coverage system. Uh, you may just need uh, about 10% of the system that only covers the prefrontal cortex. So uh, another option for reducing costs long-term and making it accessible to everyone is to, uh, to just tailor the coverage to the application that's needed. Another question, since we are on Clubhouse, and there are a lot of transhumanist singularity, all kinds of people here on Clubhouse. <laughs> mm, I was thinking, so um, could one 
could you is the data precise enough that you could basically over your lifetime record brain activity and once you lose basically your own brain capacities that mm, you have collected enough data to basically uh, uh, train a chip or some AI to take over what usually your brain would do. Do you think that's also something are people approaching you um, uh, from this uh, sort of world, basically? <laughs> Uh, no, no not, not exactly. We haven't been approached by, by anyone that's looking to kind of upload, upload their brain. Um, so I think that, um, you know, I, I'll qualify this by saying I'm not a neuroscientist. I'm an electrical engineer and a physicist at heart. Uh, I've worked at a neurotech company for almost four years now. So I've, I've got a, a kind of understanding, but by no means am I an expert in this field. Um, and, and what I would say in response to, to, to the question is that with FNIRS specifically and in and, and this non-invasive form that it's currently in, uh, we're limited to measuring just the outer layer of the brain really. So there's a lot of brain that we're not able to access. And the reason that this is you know, effective as a, a tool for understanding things like cognition or pain or anxiety or stress is that uh, your cortex is involved in a lot of these functions, e even if it's not the only thing involved. So you may have deeper structures in the brain that are uh, handling some of the, the, the processes associated with you know, whatever the experience is, uh, and only a small portion of it is reflected in the cortex. So what I would say is that uh, you would have very incomplete information about the details of what you were experiencing, but perhaps you could have a recording of uh, certain emotional responses to things. So, you know, what your likes or dislikes are, or, you know, how, how you felt when you saw that person you really cared about, your parents, your child, uh, your spouse or love, um, you know, those types of things I think could be recorded and kept and you would have some indication of, of, of kind of these brain states that are represented in the cortex. But I don't think the technology we've built today uh, is, is the answer to uploading, uh, uploading all your, your memories and uh, you know, deepest secrets into the cloud. So I'm, I'm sure you're looking at um, deriving control surfaces. I'm curious what, uh, what you can say about that at this point um and and whether there whether there's reliable control that the subject can exert that's detectable that could drive external devices yeah so uh, this is a very common question too and i kind of gave a little preface preface at the beginning of uh, uh the talk that the technology we've built is around uh, hemodynamic responses so um everything we measure uh, we're, we're measuring a lagging signal of what's actually happening in the brain. So when your neurons start to fire, uh, the cardiovascular system responds by providing this oxygenated blood to use. So I, I personally don't think FDRs is a great solution for control type of applications uh, because, they're, because of this lag, right? Anytime you're basing things on... Um, uh, it changes in blood oxygenation, you're going to lag the neuronal activity. That said, uh, there has been some work done on uh, what people call a fast optical signal. This is not something we've explored at Kernel, but the theory behind it is that it's, um, it's also called an event-related optical signal. Um, and uh, Gratton's group uh, is the one that uh, has, has done a lot of work on this. And the idea is that when neurons start to fire, there's a localized change in scattering that happens much faster than the change in absorption. And you may remember that our system measures both changes in absorption and scattering. Uh, however, we haven't, um, we don't believe we have the SNR to measure uh, individual changes, uh, like event related changes, single trial changes due to, um, due to scattering. So again, I think it's a little bit of a, a reach for like a good control application. And so instead we focus a lot on 
uh, measurement and kind of understanding of the mind, right? Really uh, a better understanding of oneself rather than as a, a control mechanism. Uh, yeah, I have a couple oh, of questions. Go ahead, go ahead. Hi, uh, hi, Ryan. Thanks for spending time on that with this uh, and with us uh, answering questions. Um, so I'm sorry, I have to admit I'm a little unfamiliar um, with the specifics of the device. Um, so I'm curious about what the spatial and temporal resolution um, looks like. And also I'm curious because you, you were talking about, uh, you know, tracking hemo he hemoglobin. If, uh, if it has the same kind of bottlenecks um, that we have with uh, fMRI or anything that's tracking, um, you know, blood oxygen, blood flow, metabolism kind of things, uh, in terms of being able to relate it to um, the firing, obviously it, there's a latency, but uh, in terms of all the different um, potential mechanisms that could be driving, a, uh, you know, a blood flow or, or blood oxygen signal, um, or if, or if this technique offers any um, advantages into, um, you know, relating it to the underlying uh, neural activity. Yeah, so um, it is similar in signal to fMRI in that you're measuring hemodynamics and kind of that, that type of, of rate of change. Uh, our temporal resolution at an individual detector level is 200 hertz or five milliseconds. However, we do a laser pattern to, to measure across the entire head without crosstalk. And uh, that means we image the whole head at uh, between seven and eight hertz right now. So we're getting a, a full image of the head every, um, I don't know, a hundred and something uh, milliseconds or so. Um, so that's the type of temporal resolution we're talking about. Uh, we're, not, we're not talking about millisecond uh, type of, of resolution across the whole head. And if you were to ask me what our main value proposition is, it's a signal like uh, fMRI, but in a portable, compact, low cost form that's easy to operate. And um, you know the trade-off you're making is uh, you only get access to the cortex, whereas in fMRI, you get the full brain. I see. Yeah, that, that was my next question was the depth, like how far can you go? Yeah, so in the, the publication, uh, we show kind of contrast out to about 20 millimeters in a phantom, 20, 25 millimeters. Uh, the typical or average gap between scalp and brain of a head is about 15 millimeters. So we're somewhere in the neighborhood of say five to 10 millimeters into the brain. <clears throat> awesome. Yeah, thank you. I just uh, was curious about those those details. Um, that the what you're what you're building is super interesting, and the portability is uh, irreplaceable. That's that's really cool. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, I need to go in a little bit, but I could probably answer one or two more questions if you if anyone has something. Um, yeah, please go ahead. Whoever has a last question, and um, and then we'll, we'll close the room. <laughs> well, uh, I, I I'm. Not... Oh, sorry, um, uh, I think you're picking up. Um, uh, try we need again. To remove our hair when when you wear the device, uh, because the attenuation. Uh... You were breaking up oh, oh, early, you... but yeah, go ahead. Uh, what about now? I can hear you. Yep. Hello? Yeah, okay. Um, so, uh, I'm wondering, when we wear a device, uh, do we need to remove our hair? Because I think the hair is black or yellow or some color. It can attenuate the signal greatly. That's the question. And, and it, it, I also have a second question. Um, so comparing the time domain measurement, what about the uh, frequency domain measurement like OCT? Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, so two questions. Hair, yes, is a uh, 
I would say, classic problem with FNIRs. Um, it's true of any FNIR system. If someone is working on an optical system and tells you that hair is not a problem, uh, don't trust them. So I will, uh, I will tell you right now, hair is a problem. And what we've done is worked really hard on the mechanical design of our system to make um, the, the waveguides that we use to couple the light uh, to and from the head as much like a comb as possible. And the reason we make them comb-like is so that they can work through uh, the hair and you can get access to the scalp, uh, scalp even if a person has hair. So we, um, we would appreciate, yeah, sure, if you wanna shave your head, we'll get great signals, I, I promise you that. Uh, but we don't want to require that as a, a, a um, first step in using one of our systems. So uh, hair is a problem. Uh, dark hair is obviously the biggest problem. Uh, light hair is less so. Um, so yes. And then in terms of frequency domain, there are also frequency domain systems that have been on the market. Uh, still, I have yet to see anything that's been miniaturized. Um, but they, they use um, a, a phase delay measurement as the, the measurement. And you can also get both absorption and scattering properties from the, the frequency domain measurement. However, the, the big downside is that they're only able to assume bulk tissue properties. So uh, unlike the time domain FNIRS uh, measurement where you get this, um, you know, kind of full uh, time of flight curve that shows the average, uh, you know, time each photon has has traveled through the, the tissue. Uh, frequency domain system only have one thing that they're measuring, which is this, this phase change. Uh, there are other techniques. Um, there are some groups working on uh, what's called INEARS, so an interferometric uh, version of, of a, a NEARS measurement system. Uh, the challenges with that, again, are really around miniaturization. I haven't seen anything compelling that uh, enables that technology to be miniaturized um, in a kind of scalable way. So there, there are tons of techniques for probing the brain non-invasively. And one of the, the reasons that Colonel picked time domain FDRs is because we could check all these boxes. We get as much information as possible uh, we can build the electronics and the optics in a way that allows us to scale it up. And, uh, you know, we see a path to kind of a mass market uh, system in the future. Um, and you know, the, the insight we had was we, you know, we looked at uh, these other things like frequency domain uh, nears and uh, also eye nears. And the, the insight was really that uh, what we did is uh, time domain FNIRS, as we've built it, as, is as close to a digital technology as possible. Um, so from the moment we detect a photon, uh, everything else is uh, happening in the digital domain. Uh, frequency domain system relies heavily on analog electronics. And so you add a lot of uh, circuit complexity to that measure. Uh, something like INEARS adds a lot of optical complexity. So we tried to remove all of the complexity that we could and push it into the digital domain because we know that digital, uh, digital things scale well. And so our technology is built to scale around all these you know, digital things that our world has been built on in the last decades. Yeah, with that, I wanted um, yeah, to... Um... Thank you so much for giving this great presentation and for your amazing work. I think this will enable also in research so many more um, avenues that we can go uh, while people, you know, are moving around to have um, precise brain imaging is quite uh, amazing and, uh, you know, it's way cheaper. So. I think also for research, this will be, um, you know, very useful and quite a breakthrough. So yeah, again, we are very honored that you came here to our club and we wish that millions of people are dead so everyone can afford one soon. So, and that's, you know, the semiconductor shortage doesn't, doesn't delay things for too long. So yeah, thank you so much. 
Um, we appreciate it. Yes, thank you for having me. Yeah, tell all your friends, everyone, uh, everyone get one and we'll all win. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> I'll take two to go. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks. And, you know, happy to come back sometime. Uh, if we, we have uh, something new to talk about, uh, I'd be, be happy to. Oh, yeah, so, that's thank amazing. you all. Yeah, please come back uh, when you have news. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll thank stay you. in touch. Bye, Ryan. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Katerina. Yeah, Thank sure. you. Um, yeah. Thanks, everyone. That was the second room today. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Um, I just make, you know, quick um, announcements. Uh, tomorrow we'll have um, news, like science news that are around health. Uh, we I found like very interesting research that um, came up the last day, so I'll share some of that. Then Ryan uh, will lead uh, uh, some tech innovations in his field, um, the room, and um, and then next week we will have on Tuesday the guest invited speaker that will talk about his paper. It's stochastic microbiome assembly depends on context. I had a lot of people that wanted to hear from a microbiome um, researcher. Um, you know, over time I had a lot of requests. So yeah, I'm glad that um, he will be coming uh, next week, uh, February 22nd. And then Dr. Levine um, will come um, and will talk about his um, technical logical approach for mind everywhere and um, it's um, a synthetic biology biology and bioengineering um, um, technology that will provide us more insights into cognition and uh, consciousness so um, Dr. Levine was um, here before with his colleague Josh Bongert they talked about the self-replicating xenobots and yeah, um, Dr. Levine does a lot of um, very interesting, amazing projects. So he will present another one of his. Um, yeah, and then we'll have Dr. Kaufer and um, the, um, it's about increased myelin link to anxiety and PTSD. So it's a uh, it's also a new paper that came out that will be discussed here. So yeah, come back and um, enjoy the rest of your evening, day, morning, wherever you are. And thanks for coming. Okay, I'll close the room now. <laughs> oh, bye everyone. Thanks for coming. This was a great day today with uh, interesting thanks, rooms. Thanks, so. Katarina. Bye, thanks. <laughs>